Thank you. Well, I am delighted to be here. I'm very excited to um, be able to present uh, tonight and um, to talk a bit about the practices uh, in U.S. Latino Catholicism, which have certainly shaped and formed my own experience of Catholicism. And um, I think that, that you will find uh, all kinds of rich resources in them, I hope, I trust, uh, for your own uh, study and future work in, in the area of Catholicism. Um, I would like to have us just begin by introducing ourselves a bit to one another. And so I'd like you to just turn to the person immediately next to you. And in the interest of our, of our topic for this evening, to share very briefly, um, introduce yourselves, and then to share what uh, ritual or practice shaped you in a significant way as either a child or as a young adult. So if you just think a moment, was there some practice or some ritual, some experience that was really formative in your own life? So if you take a moment just to think about it and then um, turn to the person just immediately next to you. So we'll just do this in twos. We'll take just a couple of minutes for that. We'd like to just hear uh, just a couple of experiences. So maybe if one person from this side of the room would, would like to share what they, what they shared with whoever they partnered with. Is there one brave soul over here? Sure, would you? Uh, visits to the Blessed Sacrament. OK. OK, and your name? Michael Bauer. Michael, OK, thanks, Michael. Visits to the Blessed Sacrament. And how did it, how did it shape your own? How was that formative for you? Um, kid would go before school. Um, and it, it was a choice to go, my choice to go, and it was quiet and peaceful, and I could ask for help for tests. <laughs> that's, yes, that's always a good thing. Yes, thank you. And maybe one from this other side of the room. Somebody like to share their experience? Go ahead. I'm Mary Bowler. Mine was, my, was really from my father. It was the family rosary. And his children, um, he would gather the whole family together our ritual as a family for life then is my mother would say Joe when you're in the casket with the rosary we're gonna expect you just to wake up because you always fall asleep as the age with the rosary beads <laughs> <laughs> and this was a practice he started in World War II as he said the blessed mother got him out of uh, World War II the invasion wow wow so really, um, the shaping and the formation of these practices that are so significant. Uh, for US Latino Catholicism, there are a number of practices that are um, quite significant. And they can be grouped in three different groups. And so I want to begin with um, just sharing a bit with you. I'm going I'm to take us through a number of different practices extremely quickly. And my reason for doing that is because what I'm trying to impress upon you is just to, that there's a huge, huge um, diversity of practices that has really shaped the worldview of US Latino Catholicism. And we'll get to the distinctiveness of what that is. But I begin, first of all, with, as you saw here, um, liturgical dramas and rituals. And there's a number of them that, that are significant. And I'm going to be jumping in and out of a lot of different communities. As you know, the um, US Latino Catholics in the United States are quite a diverse group. I myself am, as you heard in the introduction, I come from Mexican heritage. So a lot of my, what I'm going to be sharing with you is from that particular perspective. But there, are, um, there, there is a, a great, great diversity in terms of US Latino Catholicism. Uh, the first that I want to begin with is the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I begin with this particular uh, practice, this image, this ritual drama. Frequently, she is dramatized in parishes on the 12th of December, where there's a large presence of, of Mexican um, Catholics and, La and Latino Catholics of, of many different, from many different countries. And the reason why is that this image really is a celebration of the beginning of the liturgical year, and it's a Pentecost celebration that she represents. Um, the apparition was said to have taken place in 1531, 10 years after the conquest of Mexico. 
the first physical evidence doesn't happen until 1648, so some more, a little more than 100 years later. Miguel Sanchez, at that time a, a Catholic priest in Mexico, um, writes up the Nicamapoa, which is a, uh, a, a dialogue of the drama between Guadalupe and Juan Diego. But apart from all of that, this particular image, as I said, is really an image of Pentecost. And it is the creation of a genius in the sense that you have two symbol systems from two very, very different religious belief systems coming together. And by that I mean you'll notice that the figure stands in front of the rays of the sun. She's greater than the, um, the god of the sun, which is the supreme god of the Nawaz. She stands above the moon, which is the second most significant deity of the Nawaz. And, um, and yet her eyes are downcast. They're not looking straight at you. In the Nahua, um, Nahua or Aztec, those names can be used interchangeably. The Nahua and Aztec, the gods, if, if they were truly divine, they would always look directly at you. They would never cast their eyes down. So it's suggesting that she is not herself divine. And there's a little image right above her womb that suggests that she's pregnant and that she carries the center of the universe within her, which was very significant because the Aztecs at the time of the conquest believed that their way of life and their people had utterly collapsed and that they would be no more. So it signals carries uh, the center of a new civilization, um, that that is also interpreted by Christians to signal that she's carrying uh, the Christ child and that, she's, that this really is a Marian devotion. So, so what I, when I say it's a, Pente it's a symbol of Pentecost, it's because it symbolizes the birth of a new people, the Mexican people, the indigenous people, and it also symbolizes the birth of a new Catholic tradition because it is, it is this merger, both of the indigenous and, um, and Christian symbols, because she's, she identifies herself in the Nicamapoa, which is the text. Uh, she identifies herself as, as Mary. Um, so this is one symbol that is very significant and that is celebrated the 12th of December, which is when she is said to have appeared. And um, it, is, it, it does signal uh, the Pentecost event, the birth of a church, in, in the Mexican, um, for the Mexican nation. Las Posadas is another ritual, and this particular ritual has to do with um, Mary and Joseph seeking passage and looking for a place to stay uh, when Mary is pregnant and going to give birth to Jesus. Uh, we're going to see a videotape in a few minutes that will take us through the actual ritual of La Posadas. But this is just a... Um, a visual depiction. When I was growing up, this was one of the rituals that really shaped me. My mother used to organize posadas in our neighborhood, and we would knock on doors to different neighbors that agreed to cooperate, ask for passage in. They would say, no, you can't come in. And then eventually, we would wind up um, back at our house, and there would be a huge party and a celebration because there was finally a place for the Christ child to be born. Um, so this is a ritual that is enacted in many different neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods um, around the country. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's really celebrated as a symbol of hospitality. Pastorela is another. The Pastorela is um, based on a miracle play be, that, that celebrates um, the struggle between good and evil, learning the struggle between good and evil. And so you can see here there are figures that are dressed as, as, as devils because Satan was actually materially represented in this play. And what happens is that there's a struggle for the hearts of the shepherds that occurs in this, in this particular play. And when they eventually approach and are willing to see the Christ child, there's an aha moment and they realize, oh, love really is at the center of, of, of what we want to be about. So um, th this is Another wonderful example, I used to see a lot of these plays when I was a child growing up. They're frequently done right around the Christmas season because it is a celebration of the birth. The nacimiento is another practice 
Um, of course, the, the nativity scene. What is significant for Latinos is that there's always a star, the, the tree, the animals, because it's really a symbol of cosmology um, in the sense that there's, an, that, that, that there's an ordering that is going on and that uh, all the different elements of creation are present and are part of, of the sacredness of, of, of God's presence in the world. And that is symbolized through um, many, different, many different elements here. Certainly the tree, the star, the, the lambs, the camel, all, all of this is part of that. Um, and what you see, one thing that I would also point out is that in the poor villages in Mexico, even to this day, where there hasn't been a tremendous amount of influence from the United States, frequently people don't have Christmas trees. So during the Christmas season, the center of Christmas is really this nativity scene. And so the nativity scene, which would be in the homes or um, typically inside the house, whatever gifts might be distributed or distributed along the base of the nativity scene, that that really is the focal center point. Um, so a different way of celebrating. Uh, Ash Wednesday, which we're coming upon, Miércoles de Ceniza, very important feast day because it's a feast day that marks creation, the sense of, of the fact that we are um, of the earth and going back to the earth and that there's a contribution being made there. Very, very significant for Latinos because it's both a celebration of how we are part of creation and yet also um, an acknowledgement of the suffering and the pain that is, that is part of, um, of life. Viernes Santo is another example. Latinos frequently will celebrate the, um, the passion of Jesus. And so you see here a couple of images of that celebration. Um, these are taken from San Antonio, Texas. They're, the passion is, is every year celebrated at San Fernando Cathedral. It was celebrated where I grew up in El Paso, Texas. Many churches would put together a passion play and different people would take roles. And so um, it's significant because there were all kinds of, of, of roles and everybody in the community would participate and take on some kind of a role. And that uh, shaped how they understood who God was in their lives, the roles that they took. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. And then um, Dia de los Muertos. So I'm, I'm basically taking you through a bit of the liturgical season here as we move through. Dia de los Muertos, November 2nd, uh, the creation of altars, where frequently there's an image of um, individuals who have gone on before, who've passed away, members of the family that were significant, that were remembered. Um, uh, an acknowledgement and a recognition that death is part of life, very much a celebration of that. You can see in this photograph here on the lower right that there's all kinds of food and different items here on the table that represent the food that was important to the loved one who has passed away or the loved ones who passed away whose pictures are on the altar. And then the altar here on the left, you can see all kinds of different items there. Uh, images also of the saints that are significant. So this too is... Um, one of, the, one of the very significant ways that Latinos celebrate um, le the liturgy and the rituals that make up the Catholic religiosity. Um, so what I would like to do is to have us engage in a bit of a ritual. And the ritual that I would ask us to engage in has to do with um, building an altar. So if you can see here, I've put together a bit of an altar with some of the symbols that have been significant in my life. I mentioned that Guadalupe, my grandmother, always had an image of Guadalupe in her house and my mother as well. And so um, this image was one that I grew up with since I was a young child. And I have a picture here of my grandparents, maternal grandparents, who were very important and formative for me. Um, and I also have a picture, this is another ritual that's very significant of an ex voto. An ex voto is a picture that is made to honor some kind of a healing or um, an experience that has been very significant in a person's life, to honor and give thanks to, to God for that, for that particular experience. And then, of course, a, a, a cross here in the center. With um, this, These are very interesting figures. This cross has all kinds of... Um, 
different parts of the body, and um, what they each represent is a petition for a, for a healing that actually um, has been responded to, a healing that's taken place. And so one way that those healings are acknowledged and honored is that whatever part of the body was ailing, um, it's, it's depicted in a little metal uh, figure here that is, is um, nailed to this, to this cross. So this is another, very much an example of a, of a, um, of a ritual um, that, that takes place to honor, uh, to honor healings. So what I would like you to do is just to think for a moment um, about the last year of your life and to recall one or two ways you experienced God concretely and to draw a symbol of that experience. It can be either because of a particular person that's been significant in your life or an experience in nature or a symbol or anything. Those are just some options for you, but whatever it would be. And then, um, and the other thing I would ask you to do is to think of someone who is now deceased and who helped you to know God's love for you and either to write their name down or to draw a picture or a symbol of them. And so I'd ask you to just do that, and then we will, um, we'll, uh, and then when you're finished doing that, if you would just come forward and we can just put those um, all different pictures, images, symbols here on the floor. So we'll just scatter them right around the floor, right around this, this little um, altar piece here. So we'll take about five minutes for that. Thank you. Many Latinos in their homes will have an altar like this. And we'll display, we'll keep a lot of these artifacts on display um, year round. Certainly, the 2nd of November is the, is the classic time to build one of these, but it doesn't just happen on the 2nd of November. Some people will have an altar, like I said, all the time that, they, that will be a physical symbol of the sacred for them in a time when they will come and, um, and spend some time in prayer and in reflection and meditation. Um, Jeremy, I see you shaking your head. Yes, is this your experience, or? Yeah, and uh, my housemate here actually kind of was fascinated. My, my, it became kind of a tourist site at, at first in my in my room when I moved into my new place. Set it up. What's, what's that? What's that about? It's a different way of marking space than than they were used to. They're all. Yes, I mean, I think it, it, it's, uh, that's a very, you, you um, pointed out something very important to us. It's a way of physically marking space. And uh, do you want to say a little more about that? Like, how does, what does that mean to you? For me, it, it draws me, in, in, my, in my room especially, it draws me to prayer in a way that I find that I'm not as often drawn to prayer if I don't have that kind of sacrament. It's a way of creating space for, for prayer, and uh, it's especially important for me because I spend a good part of the day in the library and in my head to, to have something that's you know, physical space and isn't just about you know, a mental environment or something. When I, get out of, when I get out of bed, that space is there. I've got to walk past it to, to go to the bathroom in the morning. And, uh, It's a physical space that enters into my kind of spiritual, the way I use my mind. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us. How was it um, emotionally to do, to do a recollection like this and to think about, to remember someone or some event or some experience that was important to you? What did it do? Uh, how did it feel to do that? Somebody like to share? Okay, pick on you, Becky. <laughs> I had to see. Um, I, I mean, it's hard to articulate or, or draw or put into words or anything. I'm more like moments of grace. So just thinking for me personally, I chose the scene of an ocean, and, and an ocean is a place that kind of centers me where I find God. I'm from Kansas, so. The ocean is very uh, mystical kind of experience for me. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but it really is. And so um, 
thinking of my moments there in prayer with God and, and kind of the transcendent experience <coughs> and calling that to mind was like remembering uh, for me like the security of being in that space and the awe of being in that space. So I don't know. It was, it was nice to reflect. Um, obviously, it's a little bit harder to think about a loved one that I've lost, and I think that honoring loved ones is really challenging, um, but it's also like good to emotionally connect with those who are beyond, so, um, yeah, it was good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, I wanted to have us do this because it also is a way that we here can mark sacred space, as Jeremy has invited us into, and, um, and, and it's a way to get in touch with how much our emotions and our imagination are central to our own practice of faith, which is um, very significant. I mean, you can see all the colors and the richness here, which is uh, an invitation to get in touch with and to tap into our emotions and what's significant for us. Um, in addition to rituals and uh, liturgical dramas and rituals, there are the sacraments and the sacramentals that are also very much a part of the U.S. Latino experience. Um, and so these are just a couple of illustrations. This is certainly not exhaustive. But the lasso de, la, la, de, de boda, which is a, a rope that is um, placed around the couple that is getting married with the symbol of the cross suggesting that the love between them needs to be a love that is, or is intended to be a love that is um, eternal, that's everlasting, that is centered in God, and that's generative, that goes out beyond the, uh, just the couple, that it's for the world, that it's, it's a love that is willing to sacrifice, not only for one another, but also to make a contribution in the world. Um, other ceremonies that are part of this, the, the Ara ceremony is also very significant in weddings, which is, um, would people put people, if, if everybody did this, people in the prenup business out of, out of business, because um, in the Aras what you do is, is that there's an exchange of coins that suggests that everything that is part of my own material possession, I make it part of our relationship together, and, um, and vice versa. And so there's a, a, an exchange of 13 coins that occurs both from the man to the woman and back and forth, su suggesting that we share all our material possessions um, with one another freely. And then uh, ofreciendo mi ramo a la Virgen is an offering of flowers to the Virgin, which is a suggestion that, again, the whole notion of generativity, asking that there be a blessing from on our marriage and also um, that we will uh, that we will work to be generative in the world whether that's through children or whatever means that the generativity is 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 what's central to this love that we have for one another in in a, in a committed relationship so they, these are just other ways that um, these are other examples of popular religious practices the quinceanera the celebration of a young girl when she turns 15 that in celebrating uh, her coming of age, it's a celebration as well, that she is ready to make a contribution to the public life of the community, that she doesn't, she's no longer just um, thinking about herself, but she's thinking about the community and the role that she will take publicly. There is, um, Roberto Goizueta wrote a wonderful article, which is on the bibliography that I prepared for you, um, called Fiesta Life in the Subjunctive, and what he's doing there is providing a theological interpretation of, of the quinceanera celebration and very much looking at how it is countercultural because um, he's arguing that what it really is is a celebration of, of women in their public role, which in many cases is countercultural in various cultures and situations. And, um, and suggesting that, that that is what is God's call for, um, for all of us and for women. Uh, in particular on the celebration of their 15th, and, uh, 15th birthday. Um, another very popular uh, religious practice, the piñata. Um, piñatas, all these practices that I'm describing were originally invented by the missionaries who came into Latin America for the purposes of catechizing. Okay, the piñata 
is also a catechetical, it's primarily a catechetical tool in its origin, obviously, though it's not used that way today. But a piñata originally was always shaped in the form of a devil. So this is what I, the best I could do in terms of a devil here on the right-hand side. Or you will see the young girl there who is um, blindfolded to the left with a, it looks like six stars around the outside and then a point that comes out. And those, so there's really seven points on the piñata. Any guess as to what, that, what those seven points might signify? And it would be related to the devil or to the image of the devil or Satan. Seven sins, that's exactly right. It's symbolizing the seven points, symbolizing the seven deadly sins. And the idea here was that, um, as you know, when you celebrate with a piñata, a person is blindfolded. They're spun around three times, right? They're blindfolded. They're holding a bat. And, you know, I can, I'm already a little dizzy here. But they're, so they're spun around three times, and then, and then they're swinging at the piñata. And the piñata usually is strung up by two ropes. And they're, it's moving wildly, okay? So usually they swing at air and hit nothing, you know? And then it's somebody else's turn. But eventually a few people hit, a few, hit the piñata a few times. And then over many, many attempts, eventually the piñata is broken, which is an indication that, uh, of conquering sin, conquering evil, and, and that it takes everybody's effort to do that. It's not just one person. Everybody hits, takes a, a turn and... Eventually, somebody hits it hard enough that it opens and out falls all the candies. And the candies represent grace, okay? So the grace falls when we finally conquer sin, when we finally conquer evil. Um, and all the candies fall to the ground. And it's not just the individual who eventually breaks the piñata who takes part in that grace, but everybody present is able to um, go and gather the candies off the ground. So... So the, the teaching here is that when we finally conquer evil, that grace falls on everybody, and everybody gets to benefit from grace, not just the person who ultimately hits the piñata. So again, um, another catechetical tool. Um, devotions. The, so, so we've gone through, uh, very quickly, I realize, we've gone through um, liturgical rituals, and, um, and we've gone through some of the sacramental ways that popular religiosity functions. Um, spiritual practices as devotions. There are a number of devotions that are significant. Uh, you'll notice all kinds of devotions uh, in U.S. Latino um, Catholicism to images like this one, the Divino Rostro. You see the bloodshot eyes, the gore, the, the crown of thorns, the obvious pain. And these images often are very popular um, because the people themselves have all kinds of experiences of um, frequently of pain that they know and, they, and there's a way that there's a connection here that is made and a recognition that Jesus suffered and somehow my suffering and Jesus' suffering are connected to one another. And so these images are, um, are very popular, very significant. The Sagrado Corazón, the Sacred Heart, is also another image that's very significant. The ex voto, this is um, Santo Niño de Atoche, is the image on the far side there. But um, as I mentioned here, this is an example of an ex voto, which is um, an image that is painted to commemorate some kind of a healing. And, um, and usually there's some kind of a description that you see here and also there. I, I can just pass this around if you'd like to look at it a little more closely. Those of you who can read in Spanish probably can make out some of this, but basically it simply says uh, it's an acknowledgement for the healing that has taken place and in a spirit of gratitude for that. So obviously a young girl was ill in bed and you see her all bandaged up representing what was ailing her and that she um, was healed through a prayer to the intercession, in this case of Santo Nino de Atoche, de Atocha, excuse me. Um, devotions to San Martin de Porra from Peru, very significant as well, um, especially for the whole influence of the African in um, Latin America, which is very, very significant. Um, San Martin de Porras was not allowed to enter in um, 
enter into the seminary. Uh, for some time he was held back before he was admitted into the Dominicans because he had a father who was a Spaniard and a mother who was African, a free, uh, free black in, um, in what is today Peru. And, uh, and so uh, uh, there's a strong presence of the African thread throughout Latin America. And this, uh, a devotion to San Martin de Porras is certainly part of that. On your, on your bibliography, there is a citation for um, a work by Alex or Alejandro Garcia Rivera. He wrote a book on San Martin de Porras that I would recommend to you. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, and certainly all kinds of Marian devotions. I already talked a bit about Guadalupe. Um, here locally, there, virtually every, literally every single country in Latin America has at least one Marian devotion. Many of them have more than one. I just want to point out to you just the richness and the plethora of this. Um, very recently, we celebrated the Virgen de Alta Gracia, who is the, the, the Marian devotion from the Dominican Republic. You have uh, La Virgen de Caridad de Cobre from Cuba, La Virgen de la Providencia from Puerto Rico. I pulled these particular images out because uh, those countries are most prominently represented here in the north. Um, in the Northeast. Um, so those are ones that you would see very frequently. Um, okay, B basically, the reason that I went through all of these, and I realized very sh uh, extremely quickly, and each of them has all kinds of stories, and we could get into them in depth, but I wanted to give you just a big overview of a lot of what's out there to impress upon you that there's much that's mediating a worldview. And what I'd like us to do now is to, um, to watch a video tape of La Gran Posada, which is going to take us much more in depth to one of these practices. Um, and so we'll turn our attention to that. This is from San Fernando Cathedral in um, San Antonio, Texas. But this is part of a much longer uh, video. It actually runs an hour. But I wanted to show you a piece of it because um, well. I wanted you to be able to see how there's a connection that's being made here between the lives, the actual lives of, of, of the people and the parts that they play within, um, within the drama. And that's a very, very significant connection. And why is it significant? Because what happens inside the drama is that when, people, when, when the, the participants let go of who they are, their particular identity, and are able to enter into the character that they're playing in the drama, there is a way that, they, um, that their relationship with God shifts. Because they begin, to see, um, they begin to see themselves in terms of their relationship with God in a radically different way. This is an insight that certainly Ignatius Loyola had in, in, in terms of his own um, his own idea of prayer. I don't know how many of you have, have had a chance to, um, to learn an Ignatian approach to prayer. But one thing that was always very important for Ignatian was to use the imagination. And so, for example, you would take a scripture passage and, um, and, and read it over and over and over, meditate on it, and then become a character in that passage. I did this once myself, taking the passage of... Um, the occasion when uh, there is a, a, a young man who is ill and wants to be healed inside of a house. And um, it, well, he's not in the house, but he's let down through the roof. And there's Pharisees around. And Jesus, first of all, heals him of his sin and then tells him to take up his mat and walk. And I decided to put myself in the place of the Pharisees who are watching this transpire. And I got deeply in touch from doing that with the reality that I too would have said that Jesus needed to be crucified watching what he did, that what he was doing was blasphemous. And when I got in touch emotionally with the fact that I too would have been there saying, yes, crucify him, it shifted how I understood who I was in relationship to God and shifted my own sense of, of, of religiosity. And that's a, a very significant um, thing that is central to the Gran Posada and all of the different ritual, um, uh, the ritual plays that occur that are central in the U.S. Latino uh, popular Catholicism. 
So, um, so I was hoping that you would begin to see that, especially with the comment that was made that Mario's life and, and, the, and the posada, that there were all kinds of parallels there that were operating. Does that, does that make sense? Was there, was there what struck you, did, what, what particularly struck you, or did you, did you find anything here that you thought was surprising in this, in this video? Anything that was unusual? Have any of you participated in a posada? You have. You have participated in a posada. And um, Ladi, what was it? What's it like? Oh. Uh huh. Okay. Right, in the last one. Your name, I'm sorry, is? Berta. Oh, Berta, okay. Berta, um, and did that experience shift or change for you how you thought about Posada? You don't do it here? Okay. Yeah, I don't know what the traditions are, particularly in Boston, but I know in the Southwest it is, um, like San Antonio, many parts in the Southwest, it's very, very popular. I want to now shift a bit to talking just a little bit about how does this create a whole different religious worldview. And um, this is just a definition of what we're talking about when we talk about popular religious practices. There's all kinds of ways of thinking about them. But one thing that is important to note is that popular religious practices um, do not mean that, that that, there, that a practice is particularly in vogue or widespread or is common to a bunch of, uh, to a large cross-section of people. What it really means is that the practice emerges from the people. So you see that Mario in this videotape really takes ownership of the practice. It's his. And it means something to him. So that's significant. And that those who continue to, to practice the popular um, religion are the people themselves. And, and they're usually the people that have been pushed to the margins of society and the church. And so this is significantly different from, the from many other practices in the Catholic Church that have been pushed by or encouraged by um, the leadership of the church, the official institutional leadership of the church. U.S. Latino practices frequently emerge from the people trying to hold on to their faith traditions in the midst of a church that was resistant to them. When the apparition of Guadalupe initially occurred, there was all kinds of resistance to it. Um, the Catholic Church officially was not sure that it wanted this, the, this image to be practiced and to, uh, to be honored and for there to be a devotion. So lots of resistance to it. And what ended up happening is the people took it on and, and took it on themselves to, um, as, as a practice that they wanted to continue, whether or not the uh, leadership of the official leadership of the church pushed it. That's a very, very different thing than um, practices that are, are very typical in the North American context, like the devotion to the rosary frequently is a devotion that was encouraged by the institutional leadership of the, of the church. Okay, so, so there's two trajectories here that are quite distinct in terms of, of religious practices in the Latino community as they contrast with religious practices in um, Euro the Euro-American experience. Um, so I just want to spend a moment talking about what's significant about them. Um, one thing that popular religious practices, one thing that is very significant is that they make faith one's own. We, we know that faith is passed on when it becomes our own. And that's a very, very significant dimension of popular religious practices, that they keep faith alive and vibrant. Believers, we know, must appropriate their own faith. Um, if they don't appropriate it, it eventually dies. So these different practices allow for that appropriation to occur. Um, and they concretely create a sense of intimacy with God. That God is not something, God, God is not a being who is other or far off in a distant way, that God is very much a part of our lives. That's not to say 
that is strictly an eminential understanding of God. God still remains transcendent. But there is a sense of intimacy, especially when you take on a role in one of the dramas. Um, that's very significant. Um, there's also uh, a sense that, that, that people want their faith to be internalized affectively. They want to feel something. Um, and certainly popular religious practices allow that to happen because it's pulling, like in the case of Mario, pulling God's presence into his very real struggle to find a home here in the United States and to feel like he belongs, that he's part of a society here and he has a place here. So that is um, another very significant dimension of popular religious practices and one of the reasons that they are a gift. Another is the sacramental principle. We know that in the Catholic tradition, of course, that there is a sense that the material mediates the divine. Um, that's one of our central principles as Catholics in terms of the practice of the sacraments and the notion of sacramentals. This is also certainly present in all of these religious practices, the sense that through the material, we can um, be, get to know the sacred that the material, meaning either the practice, the religious symbol, whatever, uh, whatever the particular um, religious practice is, that it mediates the divine for us. So that certainly is, um, is a hallmark of the Catholic faith and very significant for these practices. Um, they're also a, a, a blessing in that they, they recognize a whole different trajectory of Catholicism that's distinctive from the Catholicism that came over to us in um, our Euro-American experience. What do I mean by that? Well, this quote, I think, um, frames for us well uh, where I'm headed with that. that in Western theology, uh, Roberto Goizueta writes in his Caminemos con Jesus that if, um, if Trinidine Western theology stressed the fact that God is known in the form of the true, which there's a tremendous amount of focus on that, and liberation theology, that God is known in the form of the good or justice. The U.S. Latino theology stresses that God is known in the form of the beautiful. What does he mean by that? That there is, through these practices, a tapping into the affect. My emotions get stirred. This is an insight that came out of Augustine as well. We see it in the writings of um, Hans von Balthasar as well. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, the Jesuits themselves had a very strong tradition of theodramas. If, um, and, and there has not um, been to date a, a study made of the, uh, of the relationship or the, um, the theodramas of the Jesuits in relationship to US Latino theology, but I'm hoping that someday, maybe hopefully somebody here at BC would be willing to pursue a dissertation in looking at those parallels because there's an insight, as I mentioned, that Ignatius had that is also very resonant with what's going on here in terms of US Latino theology um, and, and uh, ritual practices. Um, these liturgical dramas and rituals, the sacraments and sacramentals, the devotional practices, they're a sacramental view. All of them uh, reflect a sacramental worldview uh, world that is oriented towards discipleship, that, is to, that, that stretches towards the reign of God. That's their intention. Okay? Um, but it's a symbolic, performative way of getting at that. Um, so where does that come from? Well, we... What, what we have to remember is that there's really two trajectories of Catholicism that make their way, if we go back in time, that make their way across the Atlantic into the United States. Um, I'm calling, the, these, are, these are my terms, the, the, that, the, that the Catholicism that came over from Europe, with the exception of Spain for the moment, if we just hold Spain aside, but from Northern Europe that came to the United States is a contrasting Catholicism. Why do I say that? There's a contrast in relationship to the Reformation. It's a post-Trent Catholicism. Well, what happens in Trent? That there's a, there's a strong desire for definition, for regularity in our ritual practices, 
And there's documents that come out after Trent, after the Council of Trent, that define with great clarity what is considered a Catholic ritual and what is not. Okay, that, um, that Catholicism is the Catholicism that eventually makes its way to the United States and that forms the Catholicism that uh, begins in, in Baltimore and makes its way westward. That's vastly, vastly different from um, what happens in Spain. As we know, in the uh, 16th century, when, when um, the Franciscans uh, come to the New World and the missionaries begin a lot of these practices, those practices that they begin are pre-Trent. They're two generations before Trent, okay? So the Reformation and the, the whole reactionary dimension of the Catholic Church is not the Catholicism that comes over into Latin America. So I'm calling it a symbolic performative Catholicism because this isn't a Catholicism that's interested in defining terms, in, very, in being highly rationalistic, um, it's, a, it's a Catholicism that, uh, that comes into its own very much through ritual, through symbol, through performance, through dramas, okay? So what we see today is a continuation of, of these two trajectories that are vastly, vastly different from one another. Um, and I want to just recall for you Uh, this is a map of the United States, roughly uh, the way that it was configured in 1789. The reason 1789 is a significant date is because in 1789 you have the establishment of the very first Catholic diocese in the history of the United States, established in Baltimore. The whole of, of this whole pink area that constitutes what is the United States at that time in 1789 all of that is considered one diocese with the sea being in Baltimore. The rest of the country is not entirely, but for the most part, under control of Spain. You notice here is that there is a, a Catholic settlement that's set up in San Agustin, Florida, which, although at this point in history it is um, Spanish territory. La Purísima, which is another, um, another church community that's set up in 1684, which is roughly in what, El pa what is El Paso, Texas today. Uh, San Javier de Bach, set up in Tucson, 1692. And then in San Diego, um, there is the first of the California missions, of which there are uh, ultimately more than 20 missions that are built. But the first one is built in San Diego in 1769. So why is all of this important? Because you have this trajectory from the south of a particular Catholicism that is very, very different than the Catholicism that comes over from, um, from Europe. Um, and, um, and, and so there's a clash in terms of the sensibility of what it means to be Catholic. Um, as I mentioned before, this next frame really captures some of the distinctions between the two the contrasting Catholicism that has its origins in a post-Trent Catholicism that's responding to the Reformation. And then once it gets here to the United States, what happens here in Boston, if you even just study the history of Boston, there is this huge resistance to Catholics here in Boston, so much so that um, Harvard that won't accept anybody who's Catholic as a student in its, in its early years simply because they're Catholic. So the thinking is that the very elite institutions even in this city were designed to support and help um, the Protestants and the Protestant elite here of the city of Boston. So Catholics are also on the defensive in this country. So what happens is the Catholicism that emerges is a Catholicism that um, is also about, is very much intertwined with what it means to be an American. By that I mean that the Catholic Church positions itself in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation such that it's also trying to help people to become um, better Americans. And better Americans means someone who's going to fit in with a, with a white Protestant sensibility within the American uh, situation and experience. So, so 
that is the kind of Catholicism that, 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 that um, is inherited, and that, yeah, therein lies some of the tension that we see today, that the truth is expressed in rationalistic, verbally precise manner. That's part of this particular Euro-American Catholicism. It's very much shaped by the Enlightenment and modernity. This symbolic performative Catholicism is a Latino experience whose origins are in medieval Iberian Catholicism that's thriving in Spain in the late 15th century. We'll remember that, um, I'm going to go back to this particular slide. I put a black line that cuts off Spain from the rest of Europe, largely because there's a mountain range there that separates Spain from France and the rest of Europe. And so what happens in 15, um, in, um, in, in, 14, in the 1470s, Isabel and Ferdinand, who are controlling different sections of the country of Spain, they marry and they decide they want a pure Spain, uh, a pure Catholic Spain, and they decide that um, as a result of the fact that th there was an ongoing war with the, with the Moors, um, and eventually the Catholic forces in Spain uh, win the day in 1492. And those who are in Spain who are not Catholic, the Jews and the Moors, are told you have three months to convert. If you don't convert, you have to leave the country. So roughly about 50% of the individuals living in Spain at that time who were not Catholic do convert, but the rest of them um, 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 leave the, they so-called convert, the conversals, because actually, in fact, many of them convert externally and yet retain their, their particular practices in the home internally. So there's all kinds of tension there. But my point being, Spain sees itself at this time as being a country that is uh, blessed by God, that is God's chosen country, and, um, and that is given the new world as a prize for the fact that it has remained Catholic. So in 1524, you have Los Doce, the 12, that come over from Spain into Mexico, and only the best and the brightest are allowed to do that from, um, from Spain to come over into the New World. So Spain chooses the very best clergy members um, available and sends them to New Spain, to the New World, to convert and evangelize through all of these religious practices, to convert, evangelize the indigenous population so that they become Catholic. And, um, and so you even, you, you see an enormous amount of energy that goes into that. And, and while there are um, in Valladolid and, um, and in another community in Spain attempts to begin the Reformation in Spain, none of that ever takes root and it, it's not successful. So Spain, in effect, really does not experience the Reformation the way that you have the Reformation in the rest of Europe throughout the 16th century. Um, and, and so my point being that simply that, that Spain maintains a type of medieval Iberian Catholicism that is vastly different from the Catholicism that is much more reactionary and I'm calling it a contrasting Catholicism. You could even see it as a Catholicism that it's over against, an attempt to resist the Protestant Reformation. And, um, and so, and so th th those trajectories, as I said, make their way into, um, into the new, I'm heading the wrong direction here, into the new, uh, quote, new world. And, um, and this kind of a Catholicism, the symbolic performative Catholicism, is a Catholicism that really focuses on symbol and rites. So by that, I mean that the, the symbolic, so if we even go back to the very beginning, I, I won't flip through all of, well, maybe I sh even what I showed you at the very beginning of Guadalupe, when we looked at, oh, let's just pick her up here. Um, this symbol, you can see that the, the message there, it's a, it's a text. It's all done in symbolic form. And that resonates with what's very interesting. While much has been made of the contrast between a Catholicism of, of Spain that is coming into the New World and the religiosity of the indigenous population in Mexico 
that the notion that they're highly contrasting. In fact, in some ways, they overlap and their sensibilities are uh, consonant with one another because both attend to the question of symbols as functioning and being central and important to their own religious sensibility. With, um, as I mentioned, the, the god of the sun and the god of the moon. And even um, in the Nawa sensibility, there is a, a, devo a, a devotion, um, an honoring of a god, uh, Quetzalcoatl, who is el serpiente emplumado, the emplumed serpent. And it's, it, that, that, even that religious figure is very much a figure that's similar to um, an incarnational figure, if you will, because the serpent is a plumed serpent. The, there's feathers on the serpent because the feathers symbolize the divine and the air and the sky, hence the transcendent, and yet it's a serpent that crawls on the ground, hence the eminence. So even in the Aztec uh, religious imagination, you have a symbol for the divinity that, that, that is um, an image that's linking uh, the idea of the sky or the transcendent with the eminent or that that crawls upon the ground. So you see this um, very significant um, a mixture that, that resonates really with the, with, with the Catholic notion of, a, of, of the incarnation and, and God as uh, both, I mean, Jesus as a God-man. Um, so let me, let me just um, stop. Am I saying I'm heading the wrong direction? Okay. Let me stop there and ask you, um, so what I want to suggest to you, the real issue, this last bridge is the, is, is the final screen that I have here. I think it represents, um, I intended to represent really the challenge facing the church in this country. Namely, can pastoral ministers like yourselves make the bridge between these two very different ways of looking at Catholicism? Um, this Catholicism that comes out of a northern European trajectory, and then this Catholicism that's symbolic and performative from the south. Um, so that is the question facing us. 